Good afternoon and welcome to how to rank locally better in Google than what you are right now. Wow, I'm about to cough. Let me just undo that for a second. My name's Don Tyson James. What an introduction. He's about to cough all over his screen. There's definitely better we can do. Excuse me. Um, yeah, as I said, my name is Don Tyson James. We're looking at how to rank better locally in Google um, as a local business who's looking to serve local people. So I'm going to share my screen and get this underway so we can learn a bit more about how Google works and how you can work a little bit better with it as well as a local business serving local customers. First up, a quote from Tom Pick, the B2B marketing guy. He's actually quite a big deal over in America and I've actually read a lot of his material. Social may be sexy, but search still pays the bill. So there's a place in every single business for search engine optimization. Today, we're looking at a very specific part of search engine optimization, which is all about local optimization. We look at an overview of what SEO is and how Google works. We'll look at the importance of Google My Business in this profile as well. We're going to be looking at enhancing Google My Business to be far more than what it has been as well. And we'll also look at uh, what else you can do to improve your business um, profile through Google. We're going backwards there. And what else you can do to improve your results. And you've, oh, and I've got a bit of an offer for you at the end too. So please do stick around for that one. This is brought to you by Business Station and the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions Program in conjunction with Regional Development Australia Brisbane, Treaty Business Consulting in the Northern Territory and Business Station delivering the program in Perth and the rest of Western Australia. You watch this later on through my own YouTube channel. Just search for my name just written there uh, on YouTube. You can watch it later on. On Business Station's channel as well, that will be available in around about the next hour or two where you'll be able to then very much go and watch, just re-watch just to see if you've missed anything or if you'd like to share it with some friends as well. Bit about me, um, my qualifications, um, I guess in a tertiary sense, come from the University of New South Wales' uh, Sydney Business School. Uh, they, through them, I did a Bachelor of Marketing, a Master's of Marketing, and a Master's of Business Information Systems. Thankfully, my old employer paid for that. Awesome. Otherwise, I'd had some serious student debt right now. I then went and paid for a whole bunch of certifications that I got from the Chartered Institute of Marketing in the UK. So about seven different levels of that. And I do one or two different TAFE New South Wales courses to have my micro credentials come up so that I am able to, I guess, know what's going on um, every year and learn something new and don't get too static or too stale. Working with Facebook's uh, Community Boost Program in Australia and New Zealand as a lead trainer with Facebook, um, both globally and with uh, the Australian New Zealand office, uh, a Blueprint Certified Digital Marketing Associate and Media Planning Professional. We've got a few more of those little infinity stones coming through in the next couple of months as well doing a lot of work with government programs, specifically ASBAS, which is this one, and the new business assistance with NICE program, uh, primarily in Alice Springs and Darwin. Warning though, if you're looking for a comprehensive, this is how you do SEO uh, course, this is probably not it. This is a very general overview and very specifically concerned about local businesses wanting to reach local people. So just, um, there is a much greater topic of SEO out there. I've done lots of these things. You can see them in my YouTube channel to see a lot more of those specifics about SEO. But this one is very much about local SEO. So let's have a look at what SEO is and what Google does with your website. So first of all, your search ranking is going to rely very much on the, excuse me, these items. So the trust level of your website that's been earned over time. So the longer you've been around, the longer you've been doing the right thing and, and serving through the things that people love and trust, then you're going to be in a great place for that. It depends too on how popular a website is. So if you've been around a while, you've got a bit of popularity, you've got people coming through, you're doing very well. Third, as these balls get smaller, the number of and relevance of links that are coming from other people through to you or backlinks that's known as. Then we start to look at the, the less weighted issues, but the things that you can do a lot more with, like how well you've optimized your site or your page to be indexed on Google and other search engines, the quality of the domain registration and hosting, particularly a web hosting, performance of your page for visitors, that is about to get a whole lot bigger. In fact, that ball probably should be about the same size as the smaller green one by now, because 
Google has undergone quite a transformation in this area just this year. And looking at things like your social media links, mentions, reputation, reviews, recommendations, all those things still do feed into it. Um, not though the way from social media you may think that it does. Now, these things that are in color are the easiest things for you to get control of. You can go out there and spruik people to, to link through to your website. You can do your own optimization of your site or your page or the other words on your page to better fit with what people are looking for. You can choose a better web host. You can make the flow through your website so much easier. It's called um, user experience or UX. It's one of those things where you make it easy for people to get to your website and then easy for them to flow through the website to get what they need out of it um, and then of course you have a lot of control over things like links back from social media properties and things like reputation and reviews by asking for more of those you do get a bit of a bump when it comes to your position on google now, these ones though they take a while to sort of really make a go of so the trust level of your website is something by very definition that's earned over time it's not going to try it's not going to help you to um do it in such a way that you're going to be able to like one day just wake up and say i want to be trusted more and you suddenly get trusted more it's not quite how it works um it's something which you know there might be one real estate in town and another real estate in town this one only started this year this one's been around for 30 years now there's a trust level that comes with the one around for 30 years in the real world and that translates as well to the online world how popular your website or page is is a little bit difficult to get going because you can't necessarily predict which one's going to be the most popular out of all those different ones. Just because you spent umpteen dollars of money just trying to build the best looking website with the nicest experience and a beautiful background video doesn't mean that your website is going to be popular. Popularity can be done by um, simply running ads on television, ads on the radio, Google ads, LinkedIn ads, uh, Facebook ads, things that draw more traffic to you. But you can't rely purely on paying for ads to make yourself popular because, you know, in that case, I would just go out there, spend a thousand dollars to get, uh, you know, 20,000 people onto my website today and then turn it all off and go, yep, my page is popular. I had 20,000 people to it. You need to be getting a good solid growth in those numbers over time, not just on one day. So for instance, if you're running a competition and suddenly 30,000 people came to your website, that doesn't make your website popular. It just makes that particular event on that particular day very popular. Once you drop down to the 15 people who normally visit your site the next day, all that work you did and the money you spent on the promotion is pretty much wasted and gone. And things like um, your reputation, through recommendations and reviews and 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 ratings and those kinds of things they take time as well you can surely go pay someone in bangladesh um, with a farm full of phones to do fake ones for you by all means try that um, but that will be a very short-lived success it's very easy to tell when these are fake and google pretty much knows when they're all coming from the same country they know that though that traffic is coming from bangladesh and your business only serves people in i don't know geraldton they you're going to be in big trouble your your whole your whole presence on google could be very much at risk if you try to cheat like that now when it comes to seo there's four main disciplines i'd say there's the on-page stuff the stuff that you can do with titles and heading tags and the way you have your images not being too big and they can load fast and the formatting of your page then there's the things that happen off your website so things that happen over um, with backlinks back from other people's websites or mentions that people have made of you in social media that have led to new traffic coming through to your website or citations in things like government gazettes and uh you, know, you might have been mentioned in a scholarly article from somebody's thesis has been published uh, publicly then there's the technical stuff i really enjoy the technical stuff because you feel like you've got absolute control over that like all the all the sort of on-page stuff we do with the writing and the and the, and the, and the experiences is, is hard work but when it comes to technical there's things you can do that speed you up and they're all about basically speeding you up having things that help Google and people to read your site much, much more quickly to get the thing they need to get and then get out of your site. 
And then finally, the content SEO, which is about using keywords and the, the difference between common and long tail keywords are and little like funny little things called schema, which allows you to um, write your content in a certain way that Google can very easily read what it is. And so can many other sites. They immediately know how to index that particular kind of data. So what does that all mean to you? Well, <clears throat> basically what it means is that you then approach this into a niche. So you go, if I'm doing technical, if I'm doing, for instance, um, on-page SEO, off-page SEO, a bit of content SEO, it all comes down to disciplines. And the disciplines for you are going to be local SEO, which is what we're really talking about and looking more deeply at today. There's mobile SEO, which is specifically geared towards mobile purchases more than anything but also mobile conversions such as getting away to say your your website to make an inquiry of some degree e-commerce seo don't need much explanation about that it's all about the way your products are written the descriptions the titles all that sort of thing and whether they are done in such a way that's much more um, designed to elicit a, an instant response or conversion to that person visiting your website and then voice seo is a pretty new aspect. It's where you're making a website that provides quick, sharp, short answers for the most important questions that people ask about what you do. So with your a, um, a, a tour guide in a city, then answering questions about the things that people will see, the, the best things to do, the things to do in your city, those are the things you want to do. Now, these are more about those very quick, instant um, black and white answers, such as, you know, what is um, 153 divided by seven? What is um, the best recipe for baking scones? What is, um, what was, what did Gladys um, Berejiklian say was going to be the amount of time that Sydney would be on lockdown? Questions like that, they've got very defined answers that they can then find. Now, some of your stuff's going to go between all this. You might have a bit of voice SEO, a bit of mobile, a bit of local, a bit of e-commerce, a bit of technical. This look, it's a big bad world. SEO agencies, um, I've got one myself, which is Clickstarter, um, can usually do certain things. So they can definitely do the on-page SEO. They can definitely do the local SEO. They're very good at that, and it's very easy for them to do it. Content SEO, they're usually pretty good with that as well. They're very keen to rewrite things to make them work better for you on Google. The things that they tend to have a little bit more trouble with is the off-page SEO. They don't really like working in those backlinks. So that's sort of the realm of the dodgy corners of the internet where you get that strange person on Fiverr or on uh, eTasker or, or on um, freelancer.com or something like that who says, oh, I can get you 100, 100 new backlinks um, in, in five minutes and you pay them 10 bucks and they get those those links and they're really, really useless links that don't really do much for your SEO at all. Technical SEO is something which is a little bit harder for most SEO agencies because most of them are marketers. They're not necessarily uh, people who are technical or come from a technical background. I came from a tech background before I got into marketing. So it's one of those things where I'm able to very well do technical stuff. Mobile SEO is a very specific discipline. Commerce SEO also a very, very specific discipline within the SEO community, but the most niche one of all is the voice because not really many people are trying to optimize for that, even though it is a very fast growing area. But a lot of really good ones in there. Um, in Brisbane, Ranking Australia are excellent. Um, in Southern Australia, probably looking at like WME, census like the Yellow Pages, News Corporation, Local Search are kind of those big um, you know, former phone books and former newspaper companies that have gone into now the digital world. So they've got areas that they can do with that well, but they mainly work in the on-page SEO, some local SEO, a bit of content SEO, but ultimately they prefer to just buy ads for you to get people through on ads. So are they good? Are they bad? It's going to take a little bit of research from you to find out who does what. Unfortunately, some of the best ones in the country are individual people who are sole traders in their own space doing their own brilliant work and they don't, they're so good, they don't need to join an agency as such. So now we've got a sort of an idea of what SEO is. Here's the things that you probably will not win at with SEO. So even if it's local. So if you're in a large city or you're trying to sell to national or global buyers in a very competitive niche, like fashion shopping for e-commerce, shoes and e-commerce, um, electronics on e-commerce, you're probably not going to win this from SEO. Uh, trying to optimize against people who are, you know, multi-million dollar companies. If you're up against ASOS, and I can tell you the amount that they spend on 
advertising on Facebook alone is massive. You're not going to be Amazon at their own game. If you're in trades and services, so you, let's say you're a Sparky, you're an electrician and you want to reach people across the broader area of your city. Let's say you're on the Gold Coast and you're on the northern side of the Gold Coast and you want to get more customers down in the Tweed, Kalangatta, um, Tugan kind of area. Well, then you're probably going to struggle with that because between you up in Coomera and them all down towards the, the Kalangatta and the border area in Tweed, there's probably about 600 other sparkies that they've got to get past geographically before you can reach them. So SEO is not going to be the thing that's going to work really well for you. General retail stores and e-commerce don't work well with SEO at all, but they can work well for very localized customers, people within a few kilometers of where you are to be able to come into you. That's when it can work really well. Online coaches, online Reiki and NLP practitioners, anyone who's doing sort of those, those, those individualized consulting or, um, you know, pay for my time and you get this service kind of situations tend to not work well when they're looking to reach large areas, large countries to get across the whole of Australia. They want new customers in other States and all that SEO is not what's going to get you there because there's already 50 other established people who are well, well, well ahead of you. So what can you win in? Well, you probably won't win because your competitors have a head start. The larger businesses that have much more cash to spend ahead of you. And SEO does take time. It's not an overnight fix. So it's one of those things which will, which will, we, you will start to see results in as little as a week in some cases, but it will depend on your market and the amount of work you've been able to do on things like your website and things outside of your website that contribute to that. Um, but it does take time. Like it's a three to six, even 12 month game. I really didn't get as much um, momentum on my own particular SEO strategy for a good 12 months. And a, a client of mine, basically we, I said, look, it's going to take you nine months to get this going. I said, but ultimately it'll be 12. They dropped me in about six months because they, they just couldn't wait that much early. I'm like, well, that's fine. But um, what's going to happen in three months time in that nine month mark, even though you're not paying me, you're going to get a result because that's, you've got all this six months of momentum leading up to that. And sure enough at the nine month mark, they were the number one in their category for search and, you know, of course, they're not going to credit me for that because that was after they stopped paying for me. It was all the work I did before that then complied to give that sort of that, that, that momentum and that presence for now. And they haven't really come back down off that perch because the work was done over a period of time a couple of years ago. The things you may possibly win at with SEO is when people search for your specific brand name. And this is why you've got so many people out there doing branding and brand rebranding and personal branding and brand, 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 brand all over Instagram and, 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 and Facebook is because when you've got a brand name or your own name, if your own name is not a very common own name, it's much easier to find you in the area that you're looking for if you have a name or a brand that's, if not completely unique, at least unique to your area. So for instance, if you're advertising yourself as O'Brien Glass Repairs and you're not part of the O'Brien uh, franchise, then they're not going to find you. They're going to find the O'Brien franchise. But if you'll call yourself Patty O'Brien um, Glass Works, and, and people look for you as Patty O'Brien, then they will find you. Searches for what you do in your local area, they're things which you might win. So if you are that, um, let's just say a massage therapist who operates in, I'm going to say Perth, so I'm going to say around the Gosnells area. So if you're in around Gosnells and um, you can expect to have people finding you quite easily as a massage therapist within Gosnells itself or any of the suburbs that border it. Once you start to get about 10 kilometers away, 15 kilometers away, there's lots of other um, massage therapists popping up into the search results. So you may possibly win in Gosnells and the surrounding suburbs, but once you get too far out, then there's too many others who are closer for those searches when you get further out from Gosnells. And the same thing works for, for instance, if you are working in Brisbane, um, you can't expect to win the SEO results in Perth uh, when you are serving people in Brisbane. Kind of makes sense. A new product or service with a new name, that would be something you could possibly find. That's an area where people will be much more likely to be able to find you. So things to do with um, experiences. So you're looking for a particular theme park, a particular tour, a particular um, 
a walk through this particular garden or an event, for instance, these are things you can win with SEO because these things come with a specific name for that event, a specific date for that event, or a specific name for the experience that you're trying to, to put out there. So those things often you can win with because they're not coming up a whole lot of competition. You're not up against a whole lot of other people for those search results. So why you may possibly win with them is because local and suburb searches work differently to national and citywide searches. So as you probably noticed on Google, when you search for a particular kind of business, the first thing that will come up is ads. Second thing is um, the, the, the map and the map with the three pack of results underneath it. That three pack of results is usually related to um, a business that is the closest to serving the area that you're searching from. So my example would be, I'm sitting in Darwin City at the moment. So in Darwin City, if I was to search for a plumber, the first result that will come up will be an ad. The second result will be the map. And under that map will be three of the closest um, plumbers that service my area. It's assuming that I'm looking for a plumber in the area where I am right now. But if I lived 40 kilometers out in uh, Kulalinga, which is a very outer suburb going into the rural area, my results would be very different. So local searches in Google work very differently to what things are for, say, um, where can I buy red shoes? Which you will be naturally lent towards the results of people who sell red shoes near where you are first, but then... The people who can pay the most to get into the paid search results and the people who've done all the SEO work like ASOS and Zappos and whatever online shoe stores there happen to be that are national um, national brands, they will then get those the, the lion's share of those results. Because of all the things we're talking about before, being around a long time, lots of trust, they're very popular, lots of traffic, they seem to stay on top because of that. Um, those experiences, um, and if you're the first person, for instance, sell a particular product, you get the early movers advantage. If you're an experience that has a unique name that people look for water slides near me, then they're going to find the water slides place that's nearest to them. And experiences are often unique too, because they're unique to their local area. So if I was looking for fish feeding in uh, Derby, Western Australia, it will bring me the fish feeding experience that's the closest to Derby in Western Australia, which may not be in Derby. It may be, I don't know, in Kununurra in the river, or it could be as far away as Darwin, which is nowhere near Derby, but is the closest fish feeding experience to that particular area. So there's certain things that have now popped up that have become super, super important in 2021. And those, the balls that I had before, the big balls and all the different sizes of, of what the weightings are towards different things, um, these are starting to change that a little. So things like page experience, I'll explain what that is a bit more shortly, branded search as opposed to uh, unbranded search and answers to questions. And these are the things that you can have some control over. So page experience is all about making it really super, super simple for people to get to your website, number one, and then navigate through your website to get to the thing they actually want to get to. Ultimately, uh, once upon a time, we used to um, you know, try to keep people on our website for as long as possible because Google used to, and, and, and AltaVista and Yahoo and all those other search engines that we used to have to use, uh, they all rewarded time on site. And we look in our analytics and we go, oh, that person, these people are staying an average of three and a half minutes. They're reading lots and lots of my stuff. What it is, is that one person may be reading everything on your site, but most people are reading maybe one page, if that. So you want it to be in a position that's opposite that. We don't want people necessarily to linger on everything on our website um, if they're looking for one particular thing. Google rewards a fast action to get in get to the thing you want and then get back out again. Or if an e-commerce property, you can offset that and get people to linger for longer and buy more stuff. If you, for instance, land on a, um, a particular design for a gold chain, and then you've got, you may also like further down the page and that could get people to go to more things in your site. So the lingering time, the um, number of hits that each person will get as they're going through the site will grow and will be much bigger. Another thing that really annoys people, and I really wish people would stop doing it, is annoyances like pop-ups and overlays. So I'm talking about those things that pop up and say, oh, before you go, make sure you sign up for my, for my, for my newsletter. Now, while that might be a lot of sales gurus are saying, oh, you got to get them in your newsletter so you can get a, an email out to them. <sighs> Over 80% of people are never going to get your email. They're never going to see your email, um, even if they sign up for it. So they, they just... 
if you're using things like um, MailChimp and those kind of programs to get out a newsletter, you'll already know this, that most of the people you send your newsletter to never read it. They never open it. They don't even see it. It lands in their spam filters or people just go on, oh, this is so spammy. I get this every week of this person trying to hock their stuff and they just block you. They just put you straight in the spam bin. And if enough people will do that, you then get kind of blacklisted and less and less of your stuff's going to get through the same way. If you do the wrong thing on Facebook, you're not going to appear much in the feed. So the same thing with the inboxes, if you do too much of the wrong thing and you annoy people, they're just not going to see your emails. It's either going to be spammed out to their junk folder. So they do never see you, or it will be something that they say that drops in their mailbox and they go, Oh no, just don't, don't, don't. And as things like uh, outlook and Gmail learn more about your patterns, they'll automatically start bumping off what would have primarily been a, a, an email list that you had actually subscribed to and bumping it off to the junk mail folder because they just look, you never look at this, you always bump it off. So we're just going to spam it out so we don't annoy you. So that's the stuff you don't want to be doing too much of those pop-ups that are popping up. Hey, sign up now to get 10% off or sign up now to get 25% off. Why not just offer people on their first purchase to get 10% off, but you want their email address. That's great as well. Just remember though, that most people are never going to see your emails. Branded search has been something that's come up particularly since the COVID pandemic. So when things changed as big as they have changed, what happened is that we, as a society, started falling back on the things we know and love and feel safe with. We got more nostalgic. We started thinking about 90s music a little bit more and 80s music a little bit more. We started falling back on the brands that we knew and trusted. So it became very difficult for any kind of new brands to come into the marketplace. Imagine during the pandemic that you were a... Um, you know, Dettol, for instance, is a massive trusted brand when it comes to disinfecting surfaces and even hand sanitizer. And they've sold so much hand sanitizer um, during this period because they were a trusted person to do that. They're already making the, the antiseptic soaps and soap dispensers that you can use in your bathrooms. So people tended to go back towards those things they knew. Now, when stock was out of those things and new generic brands came up, like for instance, Goat, I've got a Goat hand sanitizer here. Goat is known for making um, soap. They make goat's milk soap, not antibacterial hand sanitizer, but they got on the bandwagon like everyone did and went, well, here's an opportunity for us to make a bit of extra money. Um, people who like our stuff, they might buy our stuff because they already buy our soap, for instance. So in an uncertain world, we tend to fall back on the names and the brands that we trust. And that's good news if you've got a brand, if you've got a name already in your community that people know, people in your industry know who you are as a consultant or they know your brand name. And it's easier to find that brand name than what it is to look for a generic thing. So for instance, to find you as your name, let's just say your name is... Um, Josie and the Pussycats Consulting. That's a terrible example, but Josie and the Pussycats Consulting. You would type that into Google. You would find Josie and the Pussycats Consulting, guaranteed of it. But if your name was um, Josephine Reynolds Consulting, and there's about 500 Josephine Reynolds who do some sort of consulting in there, it's going to be hard to find you. Even less, they look for consulting services in Perth or consulting services in Townsville, they're not going to be able to find you because there's too many other options. So you want to have that name out there. I'm working with a client now who works with designing of bathrooms and she wanted to use, you know, oh, I just want it so that people look for a bathroom consultant and they find me. I said, well, number one, no one's searching for a bathroom consultant because they don't know it exists. Secondly, they're looking for a bathroom designer. But thirdly, no one's really looking for a bathroom designer either. What they're looking for is bathrooms, ideas for bathroom designs. So what we need to do is do personal branding search on you. So people will look for, and I'll use a fake name. Let's just say use my own name. They're looking for, you know, Dante St. James bathroom designs, not just for bathroom designs. That's what branded search is. They're looking for you specifically, not for necessarily what you do. And we show that in 2020, 27% increase in branded searches happen. And those non-branded searches, things for like just bathroom designer or searches for um, you know, consultant, business consultant, those things plummeted by 22%. 
So it's really important to get your handle around why you would have a brand for your business because it makes it easier for people to find you. And then you don't have to do anywhere near the level of advertising once you're a known quantity, or you don't have to do anywhere near the level of SEO work because you're not really competing with everyone because you're competing with yourself. You are the brand, you are the website for that particular very specific name of a service. So you don't have to do so much optimization. Answering questions has become almost like the default thing we do on, on Google. We don't just go and simply go, okay, we're going to walk into Google and we're going to type in keywords, keywords such as, um, sunset particles, um, color. So we're not looking for those things. We're looking more, why is the sunset? Uh, why, why is there so much color in a sunset? So we're asking questions now more than ever before. And 80% of voice searches we do when we say, Hey, G word or Hey Siri, or Hey, um, you know, Cortana or any of those kind of systems that you use for voice assistance or Hey echo or what's it called? Um, Alexa, uh, those voice searches are usually simple questions. They're looking for a simple answer. So I was saying before, for instance, what is, um, what is uh, 280 degrees Fahrenheit in Celsius? And it will give me that answer. In fact, I can probably do it with my Google now. Hey, Google, what is 280 degrees Celsius in Fahrenheit? 280 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 137.778 degrees Celsius. Thank you for that. So I don't know if you heard that. It was in the background on my, my Google Home setting, but um, it was answering exactly what that is. That's what... 80% uh, of voice searches are, but 80% of voice searches are things such as, hey, G, where is the closest Italian restaurant? Hey, G, what time is McDonald's in Stewart Park open to? Hey, G, what time is Kmart at um, Springbrook open till? So you get those answers to very, very easily defined questions. But there's a new thing that's appeared particularly this year, which is that 61% of Google searches now don't result in clicking through to a website. So this means that if someone's necessarily looking for the closest plumber who's open 24 hours a day, they may not get to your website. They will get to a maps result. It will show you the people and how close they are to you who are plumbers open 24 hours a day. Now, is this a complete disaster for your website? Absolutely not. As long as the information you provided on your website is very clear that you are a plumber who's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, then it's able to go, oh yeah, I know I can index that and got that information nicely put aside. So that if someone asks that question, I'm able to quickly and easily answer that question. But for something more complex, such as um, how does someone, uh, how do you apply for grants in uh, Northwest WA? So that sort of thing would be, okay, that's not going to be a very, very simple answer to make, but there may be someone who's a, uh, a grants advisor or a, a grant or tender writer who's provided that answer in their website really, really clearly that Google picks up and goes, oh yeah, here we go. There's the answer. And it will list the answer in the easiest possible terms at the top of Google. You may go and click on that to go elsewhere, but you'll find that most people don't need to click to go to the rest of that information, but they will see that it was you that provided that information. Now, someone who is not, who's looking for a very quick answer is not someone who's looking to buy. So you're not losing a traffic of, oh, that person might've bought my services. If they were looking for that quick answer, they weren't looking to buy anything from you. The person who is looking to engage with someone like you will look at that answer and go, yes, that person answered that very well. Click through to your website and find out more about you. So you do need to be ready to answer lots of questions on things like your websites be able to answer the questions that people are asking. And if you don't know what those questions are, just have a think about it. What are the last 10 things that clients ask you? What are the things that people ask you mostly about what it is you do or the services that you provide? And then secondly, what are the 10 things you wish that people ask you? You, know, you wish that people would come and mention to you or that they would look for when they're looking for you. So you'd have an idea what your top 10 questions are that people ask. And you probably have some idea of a few questions at least that you wish people would ask you. So that's the basis and the bare bones of the next lot of content you're going to make for your website. 
So I started putting that in place myself probably a, a year and a half ago. And I answered sort of questions such as um, how do you how do you um, target Facebook ads at Facebook um, that members of Facebook groups? And so I provided an answer to that, which is a nice little workaround, which if you own the group and you've got admin access, you can do all sorts of things that help you to be able to retarget those particular kinds of people. That then became the default answer in Google for that question. So it ended up gets me you know, nearly 700 visits to my website every single week, just looking for the answer. And then I created another one, which was, um, well, how do you respond to influence, influencer collaboration requests? So I wrote a specific, specific article about that, that now is towards the top of Google for those responses. So what I find is I get probably about 150 people visiting my website every week for that specific thing. Now, will those people buy a product from me or a service? Probably not, but... What it does, that consistent more traffic coming into my website lets me climb the ranking for the normal questions I'm asking and answering for my regular products and services so that in my local area, because I'm the one who by far and above gets way more website traffic than any other web designer or any other SEO person in my market, then I become the default or one of the closest to the top responses to people who are looking for SEO help in Darwin or looking for a website designer in Darwin. I'm very easy to find under those. So asking and answering questions is a very powerful way of you, particularly those local questions. If you want to rank better locally, answer those questions from a very local perspective. It'll really make a difference to you. So local SEO is largely driven then by Google My Business. Now, if you don't have a Google My Business profile, you're missing out because this is where people are going to find out a lot more about you without having to go to your website. Let's just say, for instance, you're searching for a particular kind of person who does a very particular kind of thing in your very particular area. They will come up either on a Google map or when you search for them, they'll come up in on a desktop on the right-hand side or they'll come up as the, the top result that comes up in mobile search results. That is, that is the, the profile being generated by your Google My Business profile. And we're going to take a look at Google My Business in a second, but the, to give an idea of it, right? Google My Business is probably the number one thing that you need to get right when it comes to local SEO. Having consistency of information between all your different sources of information that are out there about you will be the second thing that will help you out. And then third, you'll have what we call the knowledge graph. And the knowledge graph is what is known about you from data sources all over the web that is um, coming from you know, Facebook, coming from Pinterest, from LinkedIn, from all the different networks, from the yellow pages and local search even, as well as your website and what's in your Google My Business. If the knowledge graph is strong, then there's an understanding of who it exactly it is. So how do you do all that? We go into business.google.com. Now I have quite a few business.google.com properties registered. So mine's going to look a little bit different to yours. Yours will probably look a bit more like that screenshot on the screen for little sprout there. So asking you to go and manage your business or your, your position in there, or it may do something like, for instance, I've done where I've got many of them. And so I've got lists and lists of them because I'm hosting a lot of other people's Google My Business results. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap over and go live on Google My Business in a second. But remember though, that consistency of your contact details before you go out and do this on Google My Business and all these others, it's really important to have the same information going out to all of your sources of being found. So that means what's on Google needs to be on Bing. What's on Bing needs to be on local search. What's on local search needs to be on Facebook, the yellow pages and Apple maps. All of them have to have the same phone number, the same address, the same contact details, email address and website address. Make sure those things are all consistent across them because Google specifically is looking at that as a point of authority. If you've got the same information everywhere, as opposed to Bing having one phone number, Apple having another and Facebook having another, it makes you look untrustworthy and it makes you look like it gives a bad overall experience to someone who's looking for you. So you do have to make sure if you've changed your phone number from a mobile to a landline in the last year, make sure that all the sources of information about you online that mention you, that make it easy for people to find you, all have that same phone number. 
Trust me, it makes a massive difference. I used to have a system that I used to use that did all this for me. And um, it was a hardworking little system because every time there's a little change, if I just wanted to change the postcode, it would then have to go and change the postcode on over 200 other websites where all of our information seemed to be. So there's um, that consistency thing. It's such a massive signal to Google that you are a reliable and um, a reliable business that is then can be trusted. And if you can be trusted, then you're the one who should appear higher up on the search engine queries than others. Now, the local knowledge graph is a big bucket of information and data that's sourced from different places. The first one is Google My Business, because that's, you know, that's Google's own property. But it's then also local info that's found elsewhere. So we're talking about those ones we were looking at before. You know, the um, the Bings, the Googles, the Facebooks, local search and, and yellow pages. Local search and yellow pages are pretty useless when it comes to the books. But they're very, very useful when it comes to their websites. Not because everyone's going to their website to find you. They're not. What it shows is that here is a well-used website, a directory that has um, got a very um, high quality uh, set of information and data in it that Matt, that you've got details in it that match what's in your Google, my business. It will look at that and go, yep, this verified source on Google, my business, plus this verified source on local search or on yellow pages is matching. That's great. We've got really good authority here. These people are to be trusted. And then there's a whole lot of little extra things you can do to grow that local knowledge graph. And most of those are going to be really within Google My Business. So we're going to go live on Google My Business now. I'm just going to switch over and say, hey, here I am still on the screen. And we'll go over to what Google My Business looks like when it comes to, um, well, it's going to look a little bit different for me because I've got lots and lots of Google My Business profiles, but it might look a bit different to you. You may just have the one. So let me just uh, go across to this one here. Hopefully that's right. Yep, it is the right one. So if I look in here, I've got a, a few different records for a few different kinds of businesses. What I'm going to do is a little bit of work on my own. So I'm going to look for in my list of businesses because I've got a few of them. I'm looking for Clickstarter Australia, Clickstarter Web Design. Maybe we'll look at this one here. So in this one here, it shows me, okay, here is my record for this. Now I've had my latest review was some sort of five-star review that came in from Sheena. That was quite a fair while ago. So I probably need to start going out and getting a few more, right? It'd be really nice to have them. Um, I can look at, you know, the kind of performance my website's had. It's had 440 views of my, my, um, my profile on Google in the last, how long has that been over the last 28 days? So that's not, you know, not huge. It's not also small. Um, I've come up in 343 searches and there's been 390 things have happened on my profile. So that could be things like people clicking on um, my map icon. It could be people clicking on my, 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 um, my, my content. It could be people clicking on the phone number, all those different things that they may be clicking on. Now, in amongst all this is a few little bits of gold, such as, you know, how you can be more contactable to people during COVID. So you can update things like your service availability, update your business hours, which is a really important one. If you've recently changed from, you know, doing seven days a week to six days a week, or if you um, have started closing at 5 p.m. instead of 6 p.m., it needs to be updated in there. Because when somebody looks for your business on Google, and they get the wrong information, it really, really annoys them. And I know for me, it's exactly the same. If I go there looking for when a shop is open, it says that shop's open. So I go there because it says it's going to be open till four and it's 2 p.m. I want to go and see that shop and that shop's closed. I am going to be, I'm going to be really pissed off. Like putting it in, in, in French terms, I'm not going to be a happy man. So you don't want someone's first encounter with your business to be something like that. Give them the right up-to-date information. So over on the left-hand side, you've got a, bit, a few controls. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so hopefully you can, you can read this. So over on the left-hand side, it's got my basic information of where I'm located, my posts. Now, the info is the stuff that you want to make sure that is always up to date. So let's have a look at info. Info includes such things as what your categories of business are. So all those things are things that I do. Now, you have to... When you first sign up for Google My Business, you'll get to choose one. But then once you've got the sign up done, you then can show a whole lot more. I can then you know, do things such as closing this business on Google or marking it as temporary closed or completely 
moving my my record completely from Google. I can do all those things if that is appropriate. But if it's not, what I want to make sure I do is do things like change my address. Now, this in my own business is very recently become not my address. I have moved my office to somewhere else. So I'm going to put it in here. I don't really mind you knowing where it is. So we're going to say um, Suite 66, 39 Kavanagh Street. You can come search me and, uh, and stalk me out if you want, but um, I've got a secure building. So good luck with that. <laughs> so I put in my new address because that's something which absolutely should be updated by now. So I apply that. And it will do one of thing, two things. It'll go, oh yeah, we can see you there right now. So it's under review. Um, no need to go and verify that through things like a postcard again. I've done all that. But what I do want to try and do is update. Okay, where do I service? So I'm saying I'm servicing Samoa, Timor-Leste. Now I'm not anymore starting to service all these off-site areas. I'm not servicing Indonesia, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, Singapore, or Fiji. I'm servicing now Australia. So I've got to go, I service all of Australia. Um, and then that's who I service. That's not going to come up for, for Indonesia. And I get a lot of visits from Indonesia. So I don't really, even though I'll drop my web traffic down, I don't, I can't service Indonesian people because I number one, don't speak Bahasa. And second, I can't get to Indonesia to meet them. So I'll turn that down to now I'm only servicing people in Australia. They've now got that under review to, sh to check that it's right. I also am open on Sundays now. So I'm actually open from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Sundays. So I've now added that in. But some of these may have changed. Eight to six for the rest of the days. Saturday is now a nine. So we go back to 9 a.m. So little things like this, you keep up to date and keep consistent across all your different properties is going to be really important for you. And then on Saturday, it's till 5 p.m. So I can apply that. And now that's up to date. I can then say if there's special days during the year that I'm closed. So on the 27th of the first 2020, I was closed. There are some of the special ones I'll do. Now, what I will do is say that I'm going to be closed on what is um, the Darwin Cup day, which is the, the first um, the first of, of August. So I'm gonna say add new date, July, on the Monday there, the second, that's gonna be the day that I'm closed. So I'm actually gonna say I am closed on the second of the eighth. So sorry about the American stuff there. I'm actually closed. So bang, put that in there. I'm closed on that particular day because it is a public holiday in Darwin. I won't be in Darwin on that day, but um, I will not be working on that day. I'll tell you that much. Anything else I need to change, such as the services I provide, which I've hosted, put in there, are now up to date as well. Because I don't need any of these attributes because the attributes are such things as like, I don't identify as a women-led business because I'm not a woman. Um, I do have wheelchair accessible entrance, so I can tick that. I do have a wheelchair accessible parking lot. Um, I don't have a wheelchair accessible restroom or accessible seating, um, but I do have a gender neutral restroom and you do need an appointment to come and see me. So they're things that they need to do that are within the realms of what we're doing in, in a very COVID era. So in the COVID world, we need to do these things. So I'm just um, a bit stuck on getting this working. My computer seems to have squished a little bit. There we go. So I can add those attributes later. It's probably easy if I do it in my, in my proper, I'm not identified as woman-led, entrance, parking lot, gender neutral, appointment required, apply. So now I've updated a whole bunch of things. Now, what it's saying to me now is there's a little mark up there saying that my edits won't appear until I verify my business again. So what they're going to be doing, they're sending me now a new fresh postcard to my new location. Now they've reviewed that and said, that's far enough away from the old place. We need to re-verify you. That's fine. Um, I'll still show up as my old address, but I won't show up as the new address until that's been re-verified. Now, once we're in uh, Google My Business, these are the basics. These are the basics. Updating all your services, all your um, attributes, the little thing about your um, your business, when you opened, uh, the photos that are in there, all those things are wonderful things to add. But where you're going to get the little bit of differentiation over on the left from your competitors is using posts. Now, in posts, this is much the same as Facebook. 
here is a whole bunch of posts that I've put in before that I've put in at various times to link more stuff to my profile. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop over into Facebook and I'm going to take my most recent Facebook post and turn that into a Google My Business post. So we're gonna, gonna do that when it comes up eventually. This is where the uh, internet gets a bit weird. So let's go into my, my page. And in that page, the most recent thing that I posted was this thing about being one of the first certified in LinkedIn ads. So I'm gonna copy that exact words, go to my post, go to what am I doing? Is it, is it an update? Is it COVID-19? No, it's actually an update. So updates last for seven days. So I've got that in there now. Make that a little bit bigger so you can read it. And then I can have a button, which is maybe learn more, which they can now go to my website. And then I want a nice picture in there as well. So I'll go into my here, go save image as. I'm going to save it as uh, linked cert, as LinkedIn certification. Pop into my post, add in my photo, upload it. So you're essentially you're providing another place to advertise to that's not just Facebook and Instagram or the others or LinkedIn. You can actually now put your posts on Google as well. I'll show you in a second where they're gonna show up. So now I'll put that one up there. It's now a new post that's showing up, which is great. I want it to do that. If I go now searching on Google for Clickstarter, so I'm not gonna look for my particular website, Clickstarter Darwin. Okay, it shows me my panel here, but over on the right, it's showing me, okay, this is the building that I used to be located it's very much in the, very much in the background. As I go down through here, I start to see my details of my business, but I'm starting to see there's 11 questions that have been asked and answered. There's a bunch of reviews that have been in there. Here's what I've had to say about my particular business. And then boom, look at this came out nice and clearly on Google. I'm one of the first certified in, in LinkedIn ads. So when someone comes to look for my particular business, and they see that that open panel there, one of the things they will see is that I've been placing um, things in here. I've been, I've been placing posts in there so they can see more information. They can click on that and it'll open up a panel that looks like this. So you can read that and you can read it, other things that may have been updated as well. There you go. So other things I've done in the past. So they can read through a, a, a whole lot of different things that I've provided in there in the past. Now I can put another thing in there, like an offer. And that's probably some of the things that you, probably can make the most use out of is you create an offer. Now offer can be a free consult, a free 15 minute, con minute consultation um, for anyone who um, wants to ask about it. So it's not really a great offer. It's just a 15 minute you know, discovery call. But if you set that out to be say, for instance, that offer ends this time next year for the next year, you're going to have that offer showing up in this list. So it won't go away after seven days like this thing will. So I'm seeing a few more here because I'm the owner of that profile. So I'm seeing all these different posts. No, you won't see those. You'll only see this one because the only one I've done recently. So if you do that and you add that little bit more detail to your posts in your profile, what you're doing is giving Google a little bit of extra information about you. And the more information that Google has about your business, the more they're able to match it with the things that people are searching for. So if you go, okay, part of my daily routine is that I create a post on Facebook, I create a post on, on LinkedIn, I create a post over on, on Instagram, you add in Google My Business and watch how over a period of three to six months, that increases the amount of people who are finding you through Google, not just through Facebook, not just through you know, accidentally finding you in, in, in the organic search results. You start to become known as someone who provides more content to Google. You then become more useful to Google. And of course, Google is going to reward you for that. The other things you can do, of course, is posting, posting photos. The more photos you can post of your business, the better. So you post where your business is in, all the different, I've posted a whole lot of different photos there, the building I used to be in, I'm in a different building now, things that I got up to when I went to Facebook in Sydney last year, um, you know, when I'm going around to Territory FM and filming stuff, all the little things I've done over the years, I add in there as well, because it becomes much more interesting when someone goes and looks for the photos for my business. So I go, so let's see the photos to do with the business. They don't just see, here's the building, like 
quite a while ago. This is back when it was first being constructed, I think. Oh no, no, it's just a really bad shot of the side of the building. You can see more details about what I have placed as the photos of my business. So um, in that case, just got that one. I haven't added any recent ones because they've now gone, well, you need to add more stuff because we're re-verifying where you are. So as you look through all those options, add more photos, you can add videos as well. You can add products. If you've got a certain set of products you want to add in there, um, say for instance, what's showing on your, um, your, your, um, in your shopping cart, in your e-commerce website, or if in the case of services like I am, I would add what my services are. So for instance, I've got things like this simple site is no longer available. So I need to actually delete that service and get rid of it. So there's a whole lot of work that I need to do. This is not my primary profile, by the way. So that's why it's sort of kind of out of date. It's a secondary profile. My primary profile is much, much more up to date. Things like full business websites. I want to delete all those services and create new ones that match what's listed on my website. So then you've got the ability to be able to update all these things. In my case, I've got access to lots and lots of businesses on here um, because I help manage it for other people. But in your case, it'll be all about you uh, creating the right thing for your business and the right way that you want your business to show. For now though, what I would really like to show you is um, an offer that I'll give you as an attendee this afternoon for taking the time out to actually do it. Um, this won't be available to people who are watching on YouTube, I'm afraid. Um, I can't offer it to everybody. Otherwise um, I'll be completely killing myself with all the work that I have to do for free. So in this case is you can email me at that address um, some of you I've already met before, I think. Um, some of you are very, very new people. And just tell me uh, for your free SEO review where I'll send you back a report and some opinions that I'll give you on things that I think you can get some quick wins in is your website address. And if you know it, the web addresses of your three main competitors. Um, or if you can at least tell me your website address and the city or town and state or territory you're in, I'll be able to work out who the competitors are just by the people who come up first for what it is you do in your particular area. And then let me know if you're serving local customers only or maybe people who are a bit further afield as well. And what I'll do, give me about a week to send those back because I've got a few of these sort of assessments going on at the moment. But give me about a week to send you back and give you, I guess, a starting point, a baseline from where you are and a few tips that are going to help you to where you can get your best wins, for instance. So if it's hyper, hyper, hyper competitive in your area, here's what I think you should do to avoid the competitive nature of it and get a win in this area. Or if it's not very competitive, here's a few simple things you can do to make sure you keep any new players that come into town at bay and stay at number one in that search as well. Thank you so much for coming and joining me this afternoon. I really appreciate it. I know that um, it can be a bit of a hard thing to take time out of your businesses to work on the businesses, not just in them. So thank you so much for doing that. Overall though, I'd like to really invite you to watch the rest of the webinars that I'm placing this month. Just go to the Business Station website. You'll be able to see those come and join me for them. It's pretty much unlimited. We're running out of time to the end of July. So come and see the more of those things we've got going. I'm covering a lot of areas and hopefully I will see you in the next one.